On today's episode of What to Ship, it's Better Call Sal. Hi, I'm the aforementioned Sal, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to today's episode. So we've been going on now almost two years with this show. And one of the things I get asked a lot is, Sal, what would you do different if you could affect change? And I think we affect change with this show and educating people in all things maritime and shipping. But if I had my druthers and I could be, you know, king of the day in terms of things maritime, what would I go about changing? So I came up with five things that I would go about changing. And I am sure I am missing a ton of things. There are so many things I could have listed on this list that I really wanted to. But again, for brevity and for specifics, I try to pick five topics that are across the board. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into this. Before we do so, hey, take a second, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So four months ago, I posted this story on my webpage. One out of five ships in the U.S. Navy do not have sailors aboard, which is true. They have merchant mariners. They have mariners on board. And I heard a lot on this. Uh, I got a lot of nice praise and compliments from mariners who are sailing and have sailed with MSC. Not so nice from those in charge. And I want to focus on this just a little bit. So... One of the things that I think has happened is this idea that commercial shipping doesn't have national security implications, and it does. It does in many different ways. Understand, since the end of World War II, we've seen the proliferation of freedom of the seas. One of the things that the U.S. Navy and all the world's navies have done is made it so that shipping can maneuver around the world's oceans with little to no confrontation. I'm not saying there's not. There is. But largely, it's free to move around the world's oceans. And the role of the military and commercial sea lift and commercial shipping is integral. The problem is the Navy, particularly the U.S. Navy, does not see that. Matter of fact, one of the things I argue very vehemently is that post-World War II, the U.S. Navy bifurcated from the commercial shipping. And it happened gradually, but then it has accelerated since then. What do I mean by that? So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here of how this issue has really kind of morphed and changed over the time. So one of the things, for example, is one of the videos I did was talking about sea lift recapitalization. This is a program done by the U.S. Military Sea Lift Command, the U.S. Transportation Command, about changing the sea lift fleet. These are the reserve vessels held by the U.S. that are used in time of war. And basically the, the plan they came up with is to replace really, really old, outdated ships with newer but older, outdated ships. Literally what they're doing is they're replacing 40-year-old ships with 20-year-old ships bought on the commercial market. That is not a sea lift recapitalization strategy. A sea lift recapitalization strategy is reconstructing and rebuilding the U.S. commercial fleet. That is sea lift recapitalization. Putting ships in the reserve fleet just punts this down the road. This is not a solution to what the U.S. faces where you would need to be able to deploy forces from the continental United States CONUS overseas and the sea lift fleet that they're counting on right now is diminishing in its size and it's in very poor readiness. Talked about this way back in 2019 during an exercise where the sea lift fleet's supposed to have 85% readiness. Based on that exercise, they came up at 40%. Go on here a little bit. A lot of this has to do with leadership and I am not critiquing the current leaders in military sea lift command, as you see right here. Rear Admiral Mike Wetloffer is a fine Naval officer. Same thing with Stephen Cade, who's the SES, the senior executive in that position as executive director or the uh, deputy commander, Rear Admiral Jeff Spivey. Not faulting them at all. However, both Admiral Wetlawfer and Spivey are aviators. They're not ship drivers. And more importantly, they're not ship drivers who have been weaned on military sea lift command. Stephen Cade came over from U.S. Fleet Forces. He's a Naval Academy grad. Again, what you're missing in this top leadership are the people who drive those ships, the masters, the chief engineers. And I think that is a big problem. You don't have a lot of of people who have experience. You also don't have a leadership that's of senior elements. Yes, you have two rear admirals there. You have a senior executive. But if you go back and look at the history of Military Sea Lift Command, which previously was the Military Sea Transportation Service, this is the admirals list from 1952. Now, 
MSTS, which was the forerunner of MSC, came into existence in 1949. The, com the commander of it, the very first commander of it, who proved his worth during the Korean War, demonstrated the absolute, absolute essential nature of Sealift was an admiral by the name of William McComb Callahan. You may have heard of his brother, Dan Callahan, who commanded the Naval Task Force off the Battle of Guadalcanal on the evening of November 13th and 14th, died during that battle, was awarded posthumously the Medal of Honor. William McComb Callahan had was been the first commander of the USS Missouri. He had commanded USS Reuben James. And more importantly, he was a logistic sea lift guy for Nimitz's staff during the Pacific War. He is promoted to Vice Admiral shortly after taking command of MSTS. He is the 29th Senior Admiral in the U.S. Navy in 1952. That is an extremely high ranking officer to command a sea lift fleet. His deputy commanders or his area commanders were all one star admirals. That is not the level that military sea lift command has today. Matter of fact, I would argue they're buried under a sea of admirals. There's way too many admirals in the U.S. Navy. Let's be clear. There, there's, there's an admiral for everything. There's more admirals than ships. But this diminishes the ability of MSC to argue when, again, they control one out of five ships in the U.S. Navy. If you look at an entity like the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, which is the British version of MSC, you can see right there Commodore David Eagles. Commodore Eagles has spent his last 33 years at sea with commands across the RFA flotilla. This is one of their own that's promoted up. They do staff work. They get assigned to Navy staffs. They sail vessels. This is the difference that we see in the actions of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. And I think this is a big problem. One of the issues is we're seeing a huge turnover in the military seal of command fleet. They're looking for positions across the board. This is a vital component. And again, what we're doing is bifurcating the commercial industry from the military industry. And I think we do that to the detriment of the United States. Other nations do this too, but nations that do it pretty well, I would argue, is the British, as you see right here with the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. So if I had my druthers, I would basically have akin to the senior commander at Military Seal of Command, one of the masters or chief engineers from the Military Seal of Command fleet. I would also bring in an outsider for the commercial aspect because those who sail within the Military Seal of Command fleet don't understand the commercial very well. I think there should almost be a triumvirate right there of a military commander, a military sea lift master or chief engineer and then a commercial master chief engineer or executive from outside who serve in that role. I think it's very important so that they can provide the expertise to U.S. Transportation Command and also to the U.S. military. The second issue is a global issue because we're seeing this in many nations around the world. I just happened to pull this one up. Australian government names task force to set up strategic fleet. India, South Africa, Canada, you name it. There are a lot of countries that have seen their commercial merchant fleet diminish to the point where it almost doesn't exist anymore. And they're completely dependent on foreign companies and foreign uh, flags to really handle the majority of almost entirety of their trade. And that is causing some concern. Now, nations are not going back to mercantilistic practices where they just want their cargo carried on their own ships. However, this issue is pretty important, and we're seeing this across the board. And I think when you see this kind of story, it really raises the element of, okay, what can we do that's different? And how do you raise this level in, for example, the United States? One of the problems in the United States is you have a variety of different entities that represent the U.S. maritime industry. There is no, first of all, let me be clear, there's no U.S. merchant marine. That doesn't exist as an entity or an organization. I know you hear me talk about it a lot, but it doesn't exist. And the problem you have is when you look at the merchant marine, there are many components that make up the merchant marine. There are the, the mariners who sail the vessels. There are the maritime unions that represent some, not all the mariners. There are the companies that operate the vessels. There are the uh, uh, shipyards, there are the repair yards, there, there are the contractors, there are the academic schools and universities, which we're going to talk about. There's a whole myriad of them, but I want to talk about the mariners, because I think the mariners are the ones who get the short shrift in almost all of this. 
Because remember, the thing that we counted on during COVID was merchant mariners continually moving goods around the planet. And they did. Again, about one and a half million mariners were really respon responsible for moving goods around the planet for us. It's a very small percentage of the world population that was moving goods around the planet. Most of them are not paid very well. Most of them had to sail for very long periods of time without a lot of relief because they couldn't get home because of COVID restrictions. But within the United States, there is no one entity that really represents U.S. merchant mariners. And there used to be. And I think we need to recreate that in the United States. And that entity is this, the United States Maritime Service. Under the Merchant Marine Act of 1936, specifically an amendment to it, uh, Section 13 amended in 1938, there was created something called the U.S. Maritime Service. Now, if you ever see commissionings at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, they are all commissioned as ensigns in the U.S. Maritime Service, along with some military organization that they're going into. The admirals in charge of all the maritime colleges in the United States are admirals in the U.S. Maritime Service. The head of the uh, Maritime Administration is the commandant of the U.S. Maritime Service, technically a three-star vice admiral. But what the hell is the U.S. Maritime Service? It's the mystery service. Nobody knows what it is. So let me explain it for a second. So when it was created in 1938, it was basically a training organization. The idea was it was a voluntary organization where licensed and unlicensed personnel could basically go to be trained. And the purpose was to assist in the maintenance of a trained and efficient merchant marine uh, uh, and, and provide that background. Now, it was created and established, you set up a series of training sites around the United States, Sheepshead Bay, uh, down in uh, Christian Pass, down in Mississippi, uh, out in California, in Vallejo, and of course the Merch Marine Academy, which was established on the grounds of the old Chrysler uh, uh, mansion at Kings Point. So you had all these entities that were created. And the U.S. Maritime Service kind of phased out of existence, but I think we should bring it back. I think one of the big problems we have is that the merchant mariners really do not have an entity that talks for all of them. Yes, there are maritime unions, but maritime unions compete against each other and they tend to voice concern for their small group that exists. And matter of fact, one of the problems you have is maritime unions compete against each other for jobs. And this is a big problem in a very diminishing outfit. I think we should bring back the U.S. Maritime Service. The Maritime Service should be that entity that kind of reflects this. And there are a variety of reasons why it, it can be brought back. So, for example, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, who is the Maritime Administrator. Now, much like I talked about with Military Sealift Command, with Admiral Wetlawfer, one of the issues I do have with Admiral Phillips, and I don't know her at all, I haven't talked to her, and I'm sure she's a fantastic person. You don't get to be a Rear Admiral in the U.S. Navy without having skills and, and abilities. However, she has no commercial experience whatsoever. Uh, she was a head of an amphibious group. She had been working for the state of Virginia for their uh, issues of global warming. Uh, and she's recently appointed and she's getting up to speed, which is great and fantastic. But again, one of the things we need are people who are ready to go day one into this position. I don't think you would typically appoint the head of the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, who's not a pilot. I don't think you would appoint someone to be in charge of the railroad administration who doesn't know railroads. Yet we tend to do that with shipping, but we equate, well, Navy, it's it's gray hull, it floats. It's the same thing. It's not. It's not the same thing. But what we need is Admiral Phillips to really start thinking about this idea of bringing back the Maritime Service. It should be a voluntary organization whereby if you have a credentials for Merchant Marine, if you hold credentials for this, you can become a member, a voluntary member of the Merchant, uh, the Maritime Service. Now, it's not a military organization, much like the U.S. Public Health Service isn't a military organization, or, you know, NOAA Corps, which operates the, the NOAA vessels. You can make this entity whatever you want it to be. However, it would provide a central area whereby there could be advocacy for merchant mariners, something I think that is desperately missing. Also, when those merchant mariners go off and 
go into war zones, they should be able to go fall under the maritime service for reasons of veterans benefits and other entities. This is a, this is what this was initially created for in World War II. The idea was the maritime service would provide those veteran benefits for those merchant mariners at the end of World War II. The problem was it was basically shut down right after World War II and it wasn't continuing. Now, some people will tell you, well, hang on, Sal. There is something out there. It's called the Strategic Sea Lift Officer Program, what was the old MMR, the Merchant Marine Reserve Program, created by the U.S. Navy. Well, the problem is the SSO program isn't the MMR program. The Merchant Marine Reserve Program was created so that in time of war, merchant mariners can go on Navy ships and basically be that bridge between the commercial industry and the Navy. Well, now SSOs provide basically a backdoor route to crew the ready reserve force and the reserve ships by basically calling back up to active duty these officers and forcing them to go on reserve sea lift ships. Uh, this is, again, an issue. And let me be clear, the Navy Reserve has lots of issues. I know almost no one who's in the Navy Reserves who likes the way the Navy Reserves operate. They like the mission. They like being in the Navy. They just don't like the way the Navy Reserve operates. And let me be clear, many merchant mariners don't want to be in the Navy. They don't want that. They don't want that at all. But if you create a U.S. Maritime Service, you can create an entity whereby, based on your license and your sailing experience, you're an equivalent rank, which you don't ever have to worry about. You don't use. It's just for purposes of rating and evaluation. You can use this to be able to get training, which is a big problem. A lot of merchant mariners who stop sailing lose their licenses almost immediately because it's expensive and difficult to maintain training. And this is a big problem. And if you create a U.S. Maritime Service whereby these personnel can use this, you provide a backup to this. And again, it will help countries like Australia and other countries get back and start creating their strategic fleets. If they can create the pools of mariners, and I'll talk about shipbuilding here in a second, how do you get ships kind of back up into this, then you can basically start recreating your maritime. Understand the problem you have is if you're competing against Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands, the three biggest registries in the world, you can't compete against them. Because when they're paying their mariners $22 a day as a minimum wage, you're not going to compete against that. You're never going to be able to do that. The problem you have, but is in case of national emergency, in case of war, uh, which again, no one ever thinks is going to happen, ask the Ukrainians this, you'll see that you need your own strategic fleet. All right, let's go over to our third story here. My third thing I would change, the MCU. Avengers Assemble. No, not those Avengers. I'm not talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm talking about maritime colleges and universities in the United States and around the world. The maritime colleges and universities are a huge entity that I view as being untapped and underutilized in promoting maritime history and heritage and the importance of the maritime sector. I'm a graduate of one of six state maritime academies. I'm a graduate of the New York Maritime College. In the United States, there's Kings Point, the state merchant marine Acad uh, the federal merchant marine academy, and then six state maritime academies: California, Great Lakes, Maine, Massachusetts, Texas, and then the greatest of them all, the State University of New York Maritime College. Sorry, a little biased there, but you know, hey, it's, it's it's my show. I get to be a little biased if I want to be. So there are a lot of institutions that are out there that educate and train mariners. Their focus tends to be producing graduates and getting them out into the industry, which makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. However, my argument here is that the Maritime Academies also should be focusing on educating and training not just their graduates, not just their current students, but others out there within the nation who don't know about this. So, for example, one of the things that the uh, Maritime Administration has been very proactive on, and I think it's a really good thing to do, is, cre uh, is naming the Centers of Excellence for Domestic Maritime Workforce Training and Education. Uh, they're really hitting this up around the country, even as far out, there's even an institution out on Guam here where they're using state and uh, uh, local entities. These are things like the uh, Mid-Atlantic Training Academy in Norfolk. Or in North Carolina, there are two community colleges, Cape Fear and Carteret, 
which provide training. And I think this is a great institution. This is a great way to get people interested out in the workforce. However, I think the state maritime academies and the federal maritime academy are missing out on a couple of key things here. So, for example, a few years ago, this comes from a source called Open Secrets, which basically tracks lobbying. There was a creation called the Consortium of State Maritime Academies, which in 2022 funded about $150,000. They were peaked at about $200,000 for a long time. So this was money that was coming from the State Maritime Academies, five of them. Uh, the, the, uh, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, Texas, and California. And basically what they were lobbying for was the creation of this, the new state uh, training ship. These are the training ships that are basically being constructed. The first one, the Empire State 7, is coming out of Philly with new ones being built, a total of five of them being constructed right now. So the consortium was basically funding this. I think the consortium should change their model now and start raising that money to fund an education consortium that will train and educate uh, policymakers, both on a federal, state, and local level. Back in 1999, I was a fellow at West Point in their history program where we went for a month and was educated, not in military history, but in how to teach the pedagogy for military history. I think one of the things that needs to be done is make people aware of the importance of the maritime sector to state, local, and federal entities. And there's probably no better institution to do this than the maritime academies, which do this on a daily basis. But again, what you do is you put this fund together, you pool money together, you can use this type of money or you can raise it from your alumni, pool it together, host basically a weekend or week long or month long, depending on what you want to do on your scope and scale. Basically, over the summer when the training ships are out and the cadets and midshipmen are gone, you can be training people on this. There's a uh, uh, one that's done in maritime history up at Mystic Seaport through the National Endowment of the Arts that teaches maritime history. This could be teaching maritime policy, maritime uh, structure and why maritime is important. Understand there are groups that lobby against the U.S. maritime industry on a consistent basis, and they raise a lot of money to consistently lobby against the U.S. maritime industry. And I think one of the problems is, is most people, that's all the information they have is what's negative out there. Nobody has what's positive out there. I get dinged all the time. It's like, Sal, why do you keep going against these same group of people that say this? You say it all the time to counter them because nobody else does. And I think there's a lot of opportunity out there to really educate people on the importance of of domestic maritime. This is in the United States, but the same can be done in Germany, in uh, Great Britain, in Japan, in uh, uh, Australia, Canada, across the world, Brazil, South Africa, Kenya, you name it. I think all these countries can really be talking about this and the importance it has. And the problem is we just don't do it. All right, let's go to our next story here. All right, if you know me, there's no way I was getting through this without bringing up the Jones Act. And so it was only a matter of time. So number two recommendation I have is this. So one of the things I get dinged on all the time is like, Sal, you're an apologist for the Jones Act. You're just a blatant support. You wouldn't believe the comments I get from people. People who sit there and say, you have to be being paid by somebody. I'm not. The, the only money I get is from you all watching my YouTube and those stupid commercials that pop up in the beginning for five seconds. I apologize. That's the way I get some money out of this. Uh, but my view on this is really important. I, I truly do believe, you know, granted I sailed in the Merchant Marine, but I'm not in the Merchant Marine. I don't, you know, again, benefit from this. Uh, I truly believe that having a national Merchant Marine, at, at least a, a portion of one, is important for national security, especially if you're the United States. You have the largest gross national product on the planet. You have military commitments worldwide. Probably a good idea to have a shipping entity that you can use to support it. And understand, I know what people say. Well, then just fund the sea lift aspect. But that's that's incomplete. You need to fund a commercial Merchant Marine, you can't have one without the other. And the example I want to use here is one from a video I did not too long ago talking about LNG, the Jones Act, in China. 
And liquefied natural gas is one of the perfect examples of this, I think. So back in the 70s and 80s, the United States was the preeminent LNG shipper in the world. Through the Merchant Marine Act of 1970, which created a uh, program that allowed you to build ships with what were called differential subsidies, both on the construction side and operation side, we built a fleet of liquefied natural gas carriers. Now, these were early LNG carriers. So there was a lot of technology involved in here that was being developed. Uh, there were three vessels that did not work out very well because of the technology that was being developed. But overall, these ships were built and operated. And they operated in the international trade for quite a long time. In fact, some of them are still out there operating today under different flags. But the issue we continually hear, and this video went in detail about it, and I'm not going to repeat it here, is the issue up in New England about the LNG shortage that happens every winter because New York won't allow a pipeline to pump natural gas across, and New England doesn't have enough storage capacity to store natural gas for the winter time. So there's always this issue of bringing in liquefied natural gas. And again, one of the things I showed is you can do this with just one ship. And my proposal, again, is I am not a staunch advocate. This is the problem in, in, in shipping. Let me be clear about this on the Jones Act. There's this one group who opposes the Jones Act and wants it repealed. There's this other group who favors the Jones Act and don't want it to change. And never will the two come together. And my point is, you got to make changes. You got to make changes. You got to have reform. Repeal doesn't work. If you repeal this, this doesn't solve the problem because the unintended consequences are so vast that that group doesn't ever tell you about it. They keep telling you rainbows and unicorns, everything will be perfect. The other group is afraid of changing anything for fear that's a slippery slope and it's going to lead to the demise of the merchant marine. So my plan is this. Wave in LNG carriers that are foreign built into the U.S. flag. Basically, you exclude the one provision, which is the U.S. build provision for right now for a temporary period of time, five to 10 years. You bring in LNG carriers under the U.S. flag. Those ships will be U.S. flagged, U.S. crewed, and U.S. operated. Uh, you have to have a U.S. company that's doing this. You bring them in. One of those provisions under the maritime service that I was thinking that should be done is for agreeing to enroll in the maritime service, your federal taxes are waived. Now, that doesn't mean as the mariner you get those federal taxes. Instead, the companies don't have to pay in your portion of the federal taxes, which allows them to lower operating costs because crewing costs is one of the biggest costs. I also think, too, that we should be looking at doing some sort of incentive to these shipping companies since they're operating international vessels in the international trade, even though it may be purely domestic, the ships have the capability to go international. We operate certain rules that allow them to basically run at a lower tax level and therefore save money. We allow them to amortize the cost of vessels over a longer period of time. We offer low interest loans to build new vessels, much like we do for banks and other big federal or other big commercial institutions. We do it with shipping companies. Should the company default on it, the ship is owned by the U.S. government. It comes back to the U.S. government. There are a lot of things that can be done here. We can put a surcharge on LNG that is exported on foreign vessels, very small surcharge that's done. That can be used to build up a corpus of money so that the shipbuilding can build these new LNG tankers. You can't tell me we can't build LNG tankers. We can. Now, I know what the argument is going to be. Well, they're going to be so much more expensive than LNG tankers built in Korea, which is what they're built. LNG tankers are built in Korea and China. Well, China subsidizes the crap out of them. So you can't tell me whatever cost China quotes is accurate because they're giving the shipyards ridiculous amounts of money. And by the way, those shipyards don't have to operate under a profit. And Korea is subsidizing. Matter of fact, Korea just gave $2 billion to shipyards to build. And by the way, they own part of the shipyards. So again, this is not a level playing field. And the concept that the free market operates in international shipping is the biggest joke out there. It doesn't. Because you're dealing with international groups. But right here, the U.S. has been exporting LNG in large volume since 2016. And we have not capitalized on that. That's a problem. We should have U.S. flagged LNG carriers out there. And again, this is the perfect sector to do this. Temporary waiver, 5 to 10 years, bring ships into the U.S. fleet with U.S. crews, U.S. Uh, ownership, 
U.S. companies overseeing them. They can operate domestically, moving LNG from the Gulf Coast, from other LNG facilities to New England, to Puerto Rico, and we can basically alleviate a lot of the problems. That's it. It's simple. It's easy to done. At the end of five to 10 years, if this is not working, you don't renew it. You let it expire. You let it go and the ships have to leave. That's it. This is, this is what you do. You start building these things in the United States. And let me be clear, when you start building ships in the United States, that's going to help not just commercially, it helps the Navy. It helps the military. Because one of the problems we have is that we don't build enough ships. And when you don't build enough ships, every time you build one or two ships, that's not a ship. It's a work of art. That's the problem. In China, Korea, and even to Japan, they're pumping them out off an assembly line style process. And it's probably not a great idea to have 95% of the world's shipbuilding concentrated within a thousand miles of each other in three countries who can't stand each other because that is a formula for disaster. So let's look at one other aspect where this can be applied to, and that is the cruise ship industry. So one of the videos I did way back when, when I first started this video, this, this channel, was an issue about the cruise ship industry and something called the Passenger Vessel Service Act with COVID because ships couldn't go into Canada. And so that meant the cruise industry could not sail directly from the West Coast to Alaska without that pit stop in Alaska. So when uh, when Senator Lee was basically pushing this repeal, one of the things I sat there and said is like, well, hang on, why are we just going to repeal this? First off, the three biggest cruise ship industry or biggest cruise companies Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian are all based in Southern Florida. They're within 20 miles of each other in Southern Florida, yet they're not U.S. companies. They are basically uh, overseas. They're, they're incorporated overseas in Panama, Liberia, and the Bahamas. Uh, they, don't, they benefit greatly from the United States without paying much in U.S. taxes or employing U.S. personnel on their vessels. Now, they do employ U.S. personnel in their headquarters in Florida, port engineers. Uh, uh, there's a lot of support personnel that work for them that are American. Don't get me wrong. They do. And I acknowledge that completely. But on the ships, particularly on the bridge and engine crews, they're almost all foreign uh, mariners. And my question is, why? Why? I understand it's very difficult to run a cruise ship under an American flag because you would have to pay minimum wage for every person on board. And let's be clear, the person who serves you your food, the person who cleans your cabin, the person who's working the bar aren't Americans. They're from overseas. They're working a pretty, what you would consider a pretty terrible job in terms of hours and days and wage. But for their economy, it's pretty good. And this is why Americans go on there. Understand the third world is providing first world entertainment for you on board a modern cruise ship. My issue is if you're going to come in and out of U.S. ports, at the very least, the bridge crew, the engine crew that operates the vessel should have U.S. documentation and U.S. licenses. Not 100%, but let's build a graduated program whereby if you want to come in and out of U.S. ports, no, no let's be clear, 50% of all passenger trade comes out of the United States, then let's go ahead and mandate that they hire Americans. Now, let me be clear, they hire Americans now, but very few. Captain Kate McHugh, who's a captain for Celebrity Lines, is a rock star. Follow her on Instagram, 300,000 followers, I think she has. She's fantastic, but Kate would tell you this, that starting to work for Celebrity or any of the cruise lines is minimum wage. You're not getting paid a heck of a lot of money not at least compared to U.S. standards. And again, when you have to deal with U.S. standard of living, you can't afford to work. I mean, people leave these ships because they get jobs working as baristas somewhere. That's not a great paying job. Now, as you get up to be captain, chief mate, first assistant engineer, chief engineer, you get to make more money, but you're still not making U.S. wages. However, if these ships are coming in and out of U.S. ports, they're out of Miami and Port Everglades and, and San Pedro and all these other places, then we should be mandating, hey, let's modify the Passenger Vessel Service Act of 1886, which 
controls this, so that if you're loading more than a thousand passengers on an international trade that begins and originates in a U.S. port, then a certain percentage of your operating crew, these are the licensed deck and engine officers, have to be American and paid wages comparable to U.S. mariner wages. Let's be clear, they can afford this. I don't want to hear they can't afford this. They've just lost an entire year and a half of operations and they're still up and running. The amount of profits that the cruise ships make, they can afford to pay several hundred mariners decent wages. And what that does is builds up a reservoir of U.S. mariners who can sail in the U.S. Merchant Marine. And let's be clear, if these operating companies want to go to a certain level, maybe 50%, maybe 75%, maybe then you waive certain restrictions of the Passenger Service Vessel Act that will allow these ships to go in and out of U.S. ports so that maybe you can run an East Coast or a West Coast itinerary without going into a foreign port or maybe drop passengers off at multitudes. One of the big problems that you have in the cruise ship industry right now is you come in in the morning in Miami, you have to dump 5,000, you know, three to 5,000 people off your vessel, replenish, restock, and then go out that evening. It's a really tough thing to do. It's a logistics hurdle to do that. But if you can dump maybe a third of those passengers off in each port, that makes things a lot easier on the ships. Plus, you can be replenishing those stores and those supplies in other U.S. ports. Miami is going to be at capacity eventually. Dodge Island can only handle so many cruise ships. Same thing with Port Everglades. But maybe now it's Baltimore. Maybe it's Savannah. Maybe it's New York that can take advantage of this. The trade, of the, the, the flights in, the husband, the crewing, all that stuff can be spread out. But only if these vessels reach certain parameters under a modified Passenger Vessel Service Act. Let's be clear, you're not going to be able to operate a U.S. flagged cruise ship and compete against the likes of Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian. It's really difficult. If you want the example of that, just go look at the one U.S. flagged ship that operates in the Hawaii trade, and you'll see the example right there. All right, let's go to our last recommendation story. All right, my last wish if I was king of a day and I could change maritime strategy and maritime policy is to create a domestic national maritime strategy for the United States. So did this video again several months ago, the decline of the U.S. Merchant Marine, where I talked about what led to the decline of the U.S. Merchant Marine. And it's not just the Jones Act, because if, if that was the case, then why do other national merchant marines decrease? They don't have a Jones Act. Great Britain doesn't have a Jones Act, yet they're smaller than us. Germany doesn't have it. France doesn't have it. Italy doesn't have it. The Netherlands doesn't have it. Why does it happen? And in, the, in truth, there is a myriad of issues that all contribute to the decline of the merchant marine. And my point is what we need is a national maritime strategy. And ironically, the very first national maritime strategy was the Jones Act of 1920. Uh, that was the America's first national maritime strategy. Did a video on this where I talk about this, uh, really talk about what happened. It was post-World War I. Uh, we realized the difficulty we have in not having a large international trading fleet. We were completely dependent on the British, the Germans, the Norwegians, the Japanese, and a whole variety of other nations for our international trade. And when World War I rolled around, they weren't there. But fortunately, we had a large domestic fleet we can tap into. And we had a large U.S. shipbuilding industry that we could tap into. And what we saw coming out of that is we need a national maritime strategy. We need a new national maritime strategy. We need one desperately because the world has changed since 1920. It's no longer the British, the Americans, the Germans, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Japanese, who have the leading merchant marines anymore. It's not. It's it's Panama, it's Liberia, it's the Marshall Islands, it's China, it's the Isle of Man, it's Bermuda, it's the Bahamas, it's Cyprus, it's Greece, it's Japan, it's Korea. Those are the ones who have it today. And the question we should be asking is, why does that happen today? What can we do to create that? And that's the reason we need a national maritime strategy. And understand, we've tried national maritime strategies. This is the one that was put out by the Maritime Administration back in February of 1920. I pulled this off their website. And can I be clear about something? This is the National Maritime Strategy created by the U.S. Maritime Administration. First off, can you at least, I don't know, 
Xero uh, use it not a Xerox copy when you scan it up? Do you not have the, I don't know, original? I would think they would have the original, but the, it doesn't seem to have the original. This is literally just a copy of a copy. I don't know what the heck this is. Second of all, I've seen maritime and naval strategies. They're nice. They're glossy. There are pictures. There's charts. There's graphs. No, none of this. Not in 20 pages, there's not. There's none of this in here. Uh, a lot of a lot of little like goals, four goals they put out here. Uh, and then it goes into a little bit of an introduction, talks a little bit about what exists, and then it provides this kind of, man, just terrible kind of goals with sub goals underneath it. Oh, this thing is, it, it's miserable. I love this stuff and it's miserable to read. Uh, this is not a maritime strategy. This, this, this is, uh, this, this is a unicorn. This is, you know, this is, or was it a camel? You know, this is a horse put together by committee. Uh, it, it is not good. Uh, it is terrible. We need a true national maritime strategy. And when we talk about a national maritime strategy, that means we need every player involved in formulating one. Yeah. You need politicians. Yeah. You need the maritime administration. Yeah. You need the Navy, but you also need the shippers. You need the cargo shippers. You need, again, remember the greatest revolution in ocean shipping came about by a truck driver, not anybody dealing with the maritime sector. And I think that's what we forget sometimes is we have to tap into these groups and put them together. We desperately need a national maritime strategy. The U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard should stop putting out maritime strategies that don't have a commercial element attached to them. We need this done immediately. We need to come up with a plan. And we don't need a grandiose plan that has 108 moving parts. We need some f attainable goals that we can do and execute over a short period of time. For example, back in the 1950s, post-World War II, we had built 5,777 ships. And when Admiral Cochran became the head of the Maritime Administration, the very first head of the Maritime Administration, now Admiral Cochran was a Navy Admiral. I mean, Sally just lambasted a Navy Admiral for being the head of the Maritime Administration. Cochran was a shipbuilder. He had helped oversee, along with Admiral Land, the construction of the Maritime Commission, the vast shipbuilding program. And what Cochran did is he went to shipping uh, companies in the United States, because we had shipping companies in the United States, and said, what kind of cargo ship do you need? And he got money to build 35 C4 Mariner class freighters, built them across seven shipyards to give construction to those seven shipyards so they wouldn't go out of business. And then he leased those vessels out to commercial companies. Five went to the Navy, the other 30 across commercial companies, and they were leased up. And very quickly, the companies realized these ships are great. They're big. They're fast. They are expensive to operate, but we're getting great returns from them because of the trade imbalance going on. And therefore, we'd much rather buy these vessels than pay a lease on them. And by the way, we want to buy the plans, which the government provided free. And you can go ahead and build C4s out there. These were the ships that were really the uh, building blocks of the merchant marine, world merchant marine, prior to the construction of container ships. And that was something that came out. This is what we should be doing today. We should be building 30 ships right now across U.S. shipyards, 10 tankers, 10 container ships, 10 roll-on, roll-off ships. They should be built by the U.S. government, leased to commercial firms for operation in the coastwise trade, the international trade. If they don't need them, they can be, go into the ready reserve force. That recapitalizes our sea lift. It recapitalizes the merchant marine. If the companies like them so much, they want to buy them, they can buy them. And then we use that money to build new ships. And again, we get shipbuilding going. It is not hard. It really isn't. It just takes education, will, and leadership to do it. And leadership across the board. And you need the right people in the right position. Not me. Not me. I'm a terrible choice. Don't pick me. Pick somebody else. But I'm happy to point this out. All right. Hope you enjoyed the extended version of What the Ship Today with a Better Call Sal episode. We're going to get back to our normal routine next week, report on the news that we didn't report on this week. This week, between Christmas and New Year's, we got two special episodes coming out. One, myself and John Conrad recapping the five top stories we each picked for the past year and some predictions for about 2023. And then our special episode, our Patreon episode, Q&A, answering questions uh, for that they uh, provided along with viewer questions. So be on the lookout for that. Either going to be on Friday, December 30th or on Saturday, December 31st, working out the details on that. Until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.